What happens when health and all of these other things, education and employment opportunities become a personal responsibility? There's a disconnection. There's an absolute disconnection with the fact that all of these things, these sentinel events that happened in history are actually connected. And the things that are these systems that are born out of racism are actually ignored and completely detached from what is actually happening. We have to all become actively anti-racist in our medical education, in our pre-K education. We need as a nation to be naming racism, then identifying how is racism operating here and then organizing and strategizing. Thank you so much for being with us today for our third conversation in our action series as part of our truth, action, and reconciliation conversation. This week, we talk about health equity and work being done to address health disparities. On our panel today, it's a great panel. It's going to be led by Dr. Corey Abair, who's a practicing physician and respected medical journalist. He's the chief medical editor at the Black News Channel and the CEO of Community Health TV and College Health TV. Joining him on the panel is Dr. Michelle Morse, who's an associate professor at Harvard Medical School. She is a 2018 Soros Equality Fellow and a 2019 Robert Wood Johnson Health Policy Fellow. And she is the co-founder of Equal Health, an organization focusing on global health equity. Dr. Takesha Davis is a practicing physician, the former director of community health for the Louisiana Department of Health for the state of Louisiana, and is currently the CEO of the New Orleans East Hospital. And finally, rounding out the panel is Mr. Daniel Dawes. He's an attorney and professor of health law, policy, and management at the Morehouse School of Medicine. He's also the executive director of the Satcha Health Leadership Institute at Morehouse. Welcome to all of you. Thank you so much for being with us today. And Dr. Abair, I'll turn it over to you for a great conversation. Well, I tell you, I, I could not have been um, tapped to do this by someone more exciting and uh, how can I even put this? Mitchy. That's where I'll put it. Mitchy. Uh, that, that Mitch Landry. And, that, and what that means is that Mitch uh, takes no, no, no shorts when it comes to taking care of his business and making sure that people that don't have stuff, they have it. And the people that do need things, they get it. And that's sometimes in a lot of controversy, but it doesn't matter because he speaks for the ones that don't speak for themselves. So thank you, everyone. I'm Dr. Corey Bear, and my job today is to move this along and not talk so much and let the people that know stuff uh, actually say the things that they need to say. So um, what we're going to do um, is we are going to jump right into this because, you know, a lot of times when you have a panel and moderators, we don't jump into it because you have to introduce them and they have to tell everything about themselves. But my friend Mitch over here, I'm sorry, over here, uh, has done that for me. So what I'd like to do really is to start off by um, giving up a, a question um, in, in the context of health equity. Uh, I, I like to also say that, you know, um, we should do our job so well so that no one living, no one dead, and no one yet to be born could ever do it better. And that's not a lot of pressure, but that is from Benjamin Elijah Mays. And if we all did that, things would go much smoother. But um, I'm going to read uh, this question and then let the folks answer. This is for everybody. It's for everybody here. So during our truth conversation, Dr. Jones said that we all have to become actively anti-racist in our medical education, in our pre-K education. We need as a nation to be naming racism and then identifying how it's the racism is operating here. So if we're doing that and organizing and strategizing to act, tell us if you agree with this sentiment and why do you believe some of the ways of racism is operating within our healthcare system? Um, Dr. Davis, I think you could like to jump on this, especially since we worked so hard to get this hospital to where it is today, thriving, booming um, uh, health care for Senator that looks like health care that looks like a spa. <laughs> T tell us about these, what we just discussed. Yeah, I think it's uh, extremely important for us to uh, recognize that there is a legacy of racism um, in health and health care. Uh, and it dates back uh, to the 1800s uh, that sometimes uh, we don't like to call out 
um, vividly in the way that we should and how that impacts not just um, the care that we give, uh, but the medical education um, that is um, used to train uh, our healthcare professionals and how that um, biases them uh, to the patients that they're taking care of and leads to uh, the disproportionate impact of disease and disease processes in our community. Uh, so to really tackle health equity, um, we have to do things like we're doing at New Orleans East Hospital. You mentioned uh, that I have the pleasure uh, of serving as the CEO here. Uh, as a small community hospital, it was extremely important that we didn't just focus inwardly uh, in making sure that our um, providers, our staff reflected the community that we serve, but we actually engaged the community in the care decisions uh, that were being made, what services we were going to provide, have a community advisory board, uh, not assume in a very paternalistic way uh, that healthcare has been uh, provided, that we know better than our community members how to take care of themselves, uh, and really to open this hospital as a place for not just sick care, but well care. Since we opened uh, after the support uh, of one Mitch Landrew, who I must thank uh, publicly here. Um, it has been uh, a continued fight uh, for equity for the patients that we serve with respect to resources. So once we own that there is systemic racism um, throughout uh, the continuum of healthcare, it's how do we fix it? Uh, and our fight has been fighting for loudly um, the equitable resources, whether that's from state um, federal, local resources for the community that we serve, just because it's predominantly minority uh, and this is a predominantly run facility doesn't mean that we deserve any less. Actually, we deserve more uh, if we're talking about equity um, to deal with uh, the healthcare conditions that we're disproportionately impacted with. Uh, so here, um, some of the steps that we've taken uh, is that as a CEO, I'm very um, publicly active uh, and a voice here, which is not always uh, the case in making sure uh, that our patients uh, who systematically and historically haven't had a voice uh, are heard, whether that's um, through uh, media uh, and working with our partners there uh, to uh, making sure that we have the resources dedicated to us. And then again, ensuring that our community knows that our healthcare system and the healthcare we provide here is for them. So through uh, community events, uh, we are one of the few hospitals um, that invites our community in when they are not sick. We tell them this is their hospital. This is a hospital where they should be able to come uh, and have lunch and get healthy meals while they get education about uh, how to do that better at home, uh, where they can learn about the physical activity that we prescribe to them. Uh, so we have on our campus, placed outside, um, exercise equipment. We've created a walking trail outside of our facility so that our patients know that we care about them, not just when they're ill. We're here for that uh, and want to provide uh, culturally competent and uh, the highest quality care. Um, but our priority is to really keep them well in an equitable way. Well, that, that makes sense because when we talk about the social determinants of health, we know that we talk about uh, help disparities all the time. And I, I've tried to just knock that out in every way I can because a, help, a, a disparity just means a difference. And it, it, we have to be very careful with the words that we choose now because disparity means difference. So if you live on in Florida and I live in California, there's a, a, a geographical difference, but it doesn't mean that one is better than the other. So we need to always talk about health inequities, health inequalities, and those words make people have to understand that there is a difference and one of those differences is bad. So I want to move on to Dr. Morse. So during the travels across these 13 southern states, one of the recurring themes was talking about equity in health care and the lack of trust between medical professionals and communities of color. And where do we start in trying to build this trust? Now, before you get there, I'm going to say in 1960, uh, the dean of Tulane's medical school still wrote papers to say that black people were a different species of human being. That was 1960. So the point is that as we have these implicit bias situations, people don't think that they are biased. 
it's hard to teach someone who is successful to change. So, Dr. Morse, what do you, well, how can you wrap your mind around this? Yeah, no, thank you so much. Uh, well, thank you for the opportunity to be here today. And thank you so much for that question. And, and I am so amazed by what Dr. Davis is doing as well. Um, um, and I'm excited to continue to learn from, from the whole panel. Um, but on the issue of trust, um, you know, I think oftentimes when folks start talking about why there's mistrust amongst communities of color, it's not just black communities, right? It's also indigenous communities. It's also Latinx communities. It's, it's all marginalized communities that, that have uh, mistrust. And we often talk about it as pathological, right? It's pathologized. It's, well, why do, why do these communities mistrust, you know, the, the, you know, all good and, and well-knowing and, and uh, health systems and clinics and instead of pathologizing it, I think we need to first start by saying that this is a completely rational reaction to hundreds of years, at least 400, depending on, you know, depending on where you want to start the clock, hundreds and hundreds of years of inappropriate treatment by the medical community, the medical industrial complex, hospitals, clinics, et cetera, towards these, towards communities of color. And so uh, when we talk about Black people, for example, you know, not wanting to get the vaccine, the COVID vaccine that is going to come out at some point. Um, it's often done in an accusatory way, in a way that is stigmatizing. And in fact, this is a completely rational response. So how do we work our way back from that, right? Especially for me as a, as a physician, I'm an internal medicine and public health doctor. And in my world, if my patients don't trust me, they're not going to take any of the medications. They're not going to come back to their appointments. They're, you know, that, that that is the beginning of the relationship. And so how do we build back from that, recognizing these historical harms? Well, first of all, we have to acknowledge it, right? It begins with a real acknowledgement and it's not a press release, right? It is actually, you know, being clear as hospital leaders, clinic leaders, health system leaders, um, of, of saying, not just in a press release, but in every way that we interact with the communities that we serve, you know, we're starting from a point where we are acknowledging this history, um, this ne the, the negatives of the history between communities of color and, you know, hospitals and clinics and, me and organized medicine. Um, the second thing I think we have to do after we actually, you know, transparently and, and, um, you know, truly compassionately acknowledge that history. Well, what's the starting point for rebuilding trust? It's actually, you know, actually showing, demonstrating that you acknowledge this and you're going to act differently. One of the ways that we've done that at the hospital that I trained at and have worked at for many years in Boston, Brigham and Women's Hospital, is we have a program called Adaptive Leaders for Racial Justice. And one of the community health centers in the network actually leads this uh, it's a lab, essentially, for learning kind of how we as clinicians are mis often miseducated about what truly causes health inequities, to your point, um, Dr. Herbert. So it, it's, it's recognizing that miseducation, and then it's actually saying to patients, you know, have you ever had a bad experience in the clinic or the hospital that you think is related to your race or related to your sexual identity or, uh, to, or to something else? It's acknowledging in the classroom, in the, at the bedside, in the clinic appointment that these historical issues exist. And it's, put, it's, a, it's a nod to your patient to say, I know that that history exists, but I'm trying to change it. I, I recognize that this history exists, but I want to do it differently. And then I think the third step is, is actual, you know, redress and restitution. And what that could look like in medical spaces is, uh, is a conversation for a whole nother day, but there are so many ways that we could actually remedy the harm that's been done. That would be more, again, than a press release, a more significant demonstration of our commitment to rebuilding the, rela the lost relationships, the lost trust. Um, so there are very concrete ways that that could be done and could be moved forward. And those you know, solutions and remedies should be put forward by the community that was harmed. Right. Not from, uh, you know, hospitals on high. Right. Or ivory towers. It should be communities saying, demonstrating and clearly demanding what needs to happen for that trust that has been lost to be rebuilt 
and regain. So uh, that's that's what I would that's what I would start with. Yeah, well, I think that's really important because as we start to to move through this entire Black Lives Matter movements, I mean, you know, it's it's so ironic that we have to use the word matter because matter is probably the lowest on the totem pole. God forbid if we put Black Lives on important, this country would have imploded. Uh, but what I will say is that uh, Dr. Fauci, who was a great, great man, very smart, said something at the beginning of this pandemic, which I have to say and and and, and it illustrate because what happened is that when uh, Louisiana uh, became the the, the hotspot where 70 percent of the people dying here were African Americans, I was asked to, to to address this at a national level to say what's the deal, and so I had to start off by saying the acknowledgement. The acknowledgement, unlike the Surgeon General who said, I need you to, 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 to work out and I need you to quit eating this and quit eating that. You cannot blame without the frame. Frame the situation. And then he said that the light, we need to shine a light on this, on these disparities. And I, I disagree because a light to the amount of $2 billion has been shined on this every year. But when you don't have the amount of outcome then you're ineffective. So that means it's your messenger is wrong or your message is wrong or both. And when we had him say, do what you need to do and not give the context that I can't just do well, brother. I don't have a, a workout facility and all I can eat is ramen noodles. That's all I can afford. That's in my, my, my food desert. You can't do that. So with that being said, I want to go to our other doctor here um, and, and ask him, uh, how do we start thinking about the concepts of social determinants of health from an equity lens, addressing and acknowledging that all of the factors that make up this concept were designed by systems uh, to be systems that divide us, whether inadvertently or inadvertently, mostly advertently, but some inadvertently. So I know you have another take on this social determinant that I think you'd like to probably discuss. Oh, absolutely. Thank you, Dr. Hibbert. So the the you know we we know that health inequities and I'm glad you talked about you know using a common um, word right and and knowing what that definition is but health inequities we know that they are fueled by multiple interacting determinants of health whether social environmental etc and and we know that you know they they basically operate within these geographic and demographic contexts that plague our society including but not limited to, to what you just mentioned. When you talk about generational poverty and situational poverty, low standards of living, uh, broken education, uh, educational and, and criminal and health systems, inadequate transportation, housing instability and insecurity, poor nutrition and diet, and lack of health literacy, right? And, and a lot of times we've been talking about these, these social determinants of health. We've been talking about these structural conditions in which we are born and we live and we worship and, and are employed in, right? But if you look in all of these communities, and if you look at black and brown communities across this country, what have you oftentimes seen? Running right through the middle of these neighborhoods is usually this major highway, right? And a lot of these communities, whether you are on the East Coast going to all the way to the West Coast, you'll see where there were once apartments or houses. Now you see parking lots. You'll see bus depots that were built. And when you look at the public health research, is it any wonder that, you know, we see higher rates of asthma within these black and brown communities? They are breathing in the most polluted air. So thanks to our social determinants of health uh, leaders and um, trailblazers, we figured out, yes, they are these structural conditions that have created the mess that we're in. But I want to push us to think more deeply about these, more critically, right? How in the world did these inequities, right, become entrenched in these structures and in these institutions and in our communities over time? How did this happen to begin with, right? So we know that African Americans, Native Americans, other groups, you know, they still contend with neighborhoods that are largely devoid of health sustaining and health protective resources. And they're still contending with these social determinants. Well, if we wanna move beyond merely nibbling around the edges of the problem of health inequities, we have to connect the social determinants of health to their political roots. Because that highway that runs right through the middle of the black community or those bus depots that were overwhelmingly located in these communities wasn't by chance. It, it's, it's really not an organic outcome. 
They were deliberate and they all have a political underpinning to them. So the political determinants of health really are the main instigators of many of these, right? Of course, undergirded by racism, as we've been talking about early on. And, um, and, and I just want people to think about that because we'll never be able to truly realize a more healthy, equitable, and inclusive society until we start addressing those political drivers that, that basically created and perpetuated. And uh, even today now within this triple pandemic that we're in, um, exacerbating these inequities. Even in the National Institutes of Health, when they delineate and describe the social determinants of health, people don't really read the second paragraph, but the second paragraph of that clearly states, if we don't do something about the monetary and uh, uh, political issues that re reflect and cause problems in the things we just talked about. I mean, it says as clear as day, we cannot say don't eat bad food if everything that is given to you is bad food because of your Thank finances, you. how you go to school, why, what your parents think, it's, just, it's, it's not possible. Um, or, or even Dr. Hebert, if you think about it too, if you're a black male and you are trying to exercise, right? You wanna leave your apartment or your house. You're trying to go in the community, you wanna go and exercise, so that um, you know you can take care of your health. You have to make that major decision about, will I even return, right? So you talk about all of these issues about personal responsibility, but these political determinants of health you know, are compounded one after the next, right? That, that don't allow us to be personally responsible. We want to be, but we have to overcome those structural conditions, right? Those political determinants that have caused them to begin. With. Right, I, I, will, I, I wanna go to Dr. Morse for this because we, they talked about the uh, barriers that healthcare leaders face when attempting to address healthcare disparities. What are the, some of the first steps you believe we must take to dismantle these barriers and policies that perpetuate racism in our healthcare system? Now, before you say that, it's so crazy because once we think about why we have certain illnesses, white people on our continent of Africa, when they would see someone that they were about to put onto a slave ship they would lick their faces and they would lick their faces to see if there was a lot of salt on their faces, because if there was a lot of saltiness on their faces, they would not put them on that boat to the Middle Passage, because that means they were losing so much salt that they would not make it. There was not a lot of water. There was a lot of diarrhea and a lot of scourge of illness. So if you became di had diarrhea or sweating a lot, losing a lot of, uh, of your water, then you're going to be losing a lot of salt. When you lose salt, that means you lose more water, which means you'll dehydrate and then you'll die, which means I lose my cargo. OK, so they licked people to see if they had no salt. If they had no salt, we put them on the boats. Now, what does that mean for black people in the United States? That means every black person that made it across through the Middle Passage has a genetic, genetically high salt intolerance so that they keep salt inside of their bodies. If you keep salt inside of your body, you keep water inside of your body. The first pill they give you if you have hypertension is a salt a salt water basically pill, a pill that makes you pee out all the water that you're keeping because of the salt. So if you tell black people the only reason why you have hypertension is because genetically you are salt sensitive, that means everything. But no one listening to this out there will probably even know that that's the case. We have pictures of black of white men licking the faces of black men. With that being said, Dr. Morris, how do we poke a hole in this? How do we do this? I well, I can, I'm very in, interested to see what what Dr. Davis and what uh, Daniel Dawes also think about this. It's a huge question. <laughs> it is. A, um, I well, mean, yeah, all, the, all three of you going to get it. It's I just a billion dollar question. <laughs> trillion dollar question. And I and I also think that, you know, the what how we define black, how we define race, how we define racism are all also such fundamental parts of how we deconstruct these systems of oppression and racial hierarchy 
in this country and around the world. And I have to say, I think that's one of the things that makes me hopeful, actually, that we will, maybe not optimistic, but hopeful that we will win is because there is a level of global solidarity around these issues right now um, that I haven't seen since kind of the early days of the AIDS movement. And I, and I really, I, I find that to be such an important source of power for change um, is recognizing that this is not just a black American American struggle. This is not just a brown American struggle. It's not an indigenous American struggle. It, it truly is a global struggle. And when we're looking for solutions to huge questions like the one you just asked, Dr. Hebert, is it has to be um, uh, done in a framework of global solidarity. And that's why the organization that I helped to start, you know, one of the most important things that we're doing actually with the mentorship of Dr. Kamara Jones is a global campaign against racism, which is 24 chapters across 11 countries, including Navajo Nation. Um, so we're talking about not just racism, but racial hierarchy and racial capitalism and colonialism and all of these other larger forces to uh, Daniel Dawes's point that are operating in our clinics, hospitals and health systems all over the world to produce the same bad outcome over and over and over and over again with the same pattern, right? White people on top, everybody else on the bottom, right? That's what's happening all around the world. And so how do we mobilize to actually address that? I mean, what it's meant for us in our campaign is just you know, a really deep commitment to learning with humility, um, to following the lead of community organizers and learning from them because as health providers, we are not trained in organizing um, and we can very easily, I think, uh, become co-opted honestly by systems of oppression um, and, and not recognize that we think we're doing good when we're actually doing harm. Um, so that commitment has been a huge part um, of the work that we're trying to do. I think another piece is recognizing that beyond the humility piece, another piece is recognizing fragility. And I, I don't, I'm not someone who likes to go around talking about white fragility all the time, but I will tell you that what uh, all of our chapters of our campaign see when they bring this issue of racial hierarchy and oppression and marginalization and racial capitalism uh, and colonialism to you know, leaders of, of different health systems and hospitals, especially the predominantly white ones, um, they are met with fierce resistance, right? It's, what are you talking about? We don't have structural racism here. We don't have institutional racism here. That's something that happens way out there. And so another way that we fight that is by actually demonstrating, no, actually within this institution, here's the example. And one of the things we did at Brigham and Women's was to actually demonstrate over 10 years that systematically Black and Latinx patients were more likely to be admitted to the general medicine service with heart failure than they were to the cardiology service. That is actually the definition of institutional racism, right? It's, it is disproportionately advantaging some, disproportionately advantaging others in access to a resource, the resource being subspecialty care by cardiologists. And as a hospitalist, I myself had to say, well, when you look at the outcomes, the Black and Latinx patients that are admitted on the cardiology service for heart failure, their rate of readmission is the same as the white patients, actually. And so when you get access to that resource, which, you know, there are endless barriers, whether it's insurance and who your primary care doctor is and all the other ways that we ration health care by ability to pay and by race, when you get rid of that, look, all of those, you know, purported biological differences go away. And outcomes are equal. So I think the second thing I would say to answer your huge question is getting really concrete examples of how racism is operating, again, to Kamara Jones's point, and showing how you can actually interrupt that cycle and fix it. And that's what Brigham and Women's is working on right now in the, in the cardiology and general medicine services. Well, thank you. Uh, Dr. Davis, you, you know, you, you've experienced this. I mean, how, how long did we fight to get, you know, a census over five into these patients, into this hospital, and then once we beat the streets, and then went to the faith-based community for people that trust us, then numbers kind of went through the roof. What do you think are some of the things that that you will be able to do, or that you see in that realm? Absolutely, um, this is, as Dr. Moore said, uh, a huge issue for us to tackle. Um, but we first have to just acknowledge, uh, as she said, that 
racism is a social construct. And the differences that we see, these health inequities, are not biologically or genetically um, rooted. It's rooted in racism. And so we have to be, as providers, willing to say what we have been taught has to be untaught, right? Medical schools and medical education have been led by racist white men since the beginning of time. It wasn't until the 1960s that the American Association of Medical Colleges would even acknowledge that minorities needed to be equally admitted to medical schools. We advance forward today. We are still only represented less than 10 percent in medical schools. When we look at people of color and evidence demonstrates that people who look like you and have a similar lived experience will provide you a better outcome. So we have to recognize that and not be unwilling to be vulnerable because let's be clear, right? As Dr. Moore said, when you start talking about these issues in healthcare systems that are run by the majority, they feel threatened. They don't think that these are issues that they have. They don't think that they're racist or that they're participating in a racist system. So you have to start with the data because the data is undeniable. So you have to start with the data and own it. That's what we're doing, not just here in New Orleans East Hospital, but we're a part of a five, soon to be six hospital system here and saying to our leaders, here's the data, the data that we own. We say we come to work every day to be patient first, give the highest quality of care. That's our mantra. But we see these differences that we cannot explain away based upon biology or genetics. Once you acknowledge those differences, it's the political fight to Dr. Dawes's point. How do you then put the resources? Because giving me the same amount of resources for the community that's disproportionately impacted as everywhere else is not equity, right? And we all know that, but our leaders of these healthcare systems, either they don't know it or they don't want to know it, but it's our job right, to be more forceful. And sometimes that's tough, right? We have to think about our own job security, right? Is that going to mean they're going to replace me <laughs> um, if I am pushing for this? But we have to be willing to do that and have the support of colleagues like those that are here. Um, Dr. Bear knows I, I, I use him often when I'm, you know, at wit's end and saying, we're not getting what we need. And I'm not willing to give anything less than what I would accept for my own family in this hospital. So how do we go around the barriers above, under, around, whatever we need to do to get what we need? Uh, and we have to be willing to do that. The last I, thing I, I will say. I just go yell. Yeah, he just goes yell. He, he, he yells. Uh, and then I can, you know, we play good cop, bad cop. But you have to <laughs> have that. Right. You need to have those resources and support to say if you step out there um, and you're talking publicly about the challenges in your own system in trying to give better care, that there's going to be support to make sure that you're protected to do it. Last thing I would say is that as we start, as we're tackling these issues and it's more at the forefront, of course, because what we've seen with the health inequities and outcomes with respect to coronavirus in the very vivid social injustices that we see. It takes more than just cultural competence training and implicit bias training and people checking the box. We have to say that we need to embed in our institutions always a lens of equity in all of our policies because everybody is now running the race on how they can get all of their staff with implicit bias training and now we fixed it. Well, we haven't done anything but giving people another two hours uh, about things that they really already know, <laughs> right? We, we've just repeated to them what they know. We need to put the resources to how do we actually bring true sustainable changes to our community to improve their health outcomes. And for hospitals and healthcare systems, that's different. That means getting out and working with your community on how do we bring more healthy food options to the community. That doesn't mean I'm gonna get paid through Medicaid or Medicare for that, but that's the right thing to do. How do we provide opportunities for our community members 
to have better jobs. Be a point of economic incentive for your community because we know if there's better education, better jobs, then our community members can make those better choices to your point. So for us, it really is challenging the status quo, getting outside of the four walls of your hospital and doing what is considered non-traditional, right? When, when I said I was coming out of my chief residency year uh, at UT Southwestern and said I was gonna go uh, to get my master's in public health at Harvard University, no doubt, I was told by a myriad of professors that that was crazy. Why would you ever wanna do public health? Because we didn't take care of communities, right? As doctors, we take care of people onesies and twosies. But to think about the community as our patient was absurd back then. So, you know, we have to change that mantra that we are serving our communities. And if we change the mantra to we're serving our communities, we're going to serve our patients all the better. Yeah. It, it, it's not enough to have the training. And we, we just went through LCME training at LSU. And so I'm sitting there amongst a lot of people that don't look like me. And I say, you know, we have the policy to bring in new doctors and bring in uh, doctors of, of varying uh, uh, economic status and um, uh, color and race and sexual orientation. They say, well, great, Dr. Abraham, that's awesome. But where are they? <laughs> I'm like, well, they're coming. Well, no, but they're not here. So the concept of you having a policy is no longer, it's, that's not good enough. So there's a hospital, in, a little hospital in Oregon, University of Oregon, and they said they wanted to have seven black cardiovascular surgeons on staff in four years, and they have six now. It's because they made it their business to find them. So with that being said, Dr. Dawes, I want to ask you, um, tell us about, you do a lot of good work in Morehouse School of Medicine. My uncle was the president of Morehouse School of Medicine at one point, John Maupin. Um, All right. And my boy. So Tell us about your work and how you believe it will lead to innovation and long-term change and how you can get other people like us involved and create more coalitions to get to the root of these historic challenges. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that. So, you know, at uh, the Satcher Health Leadership Institute at Morehouse School of Medicine, we are about creating systemic change at the intersection of equity and policy. And when you look back at uh, the history, at the federal level especially, right, in terms of advancing equity-focused policy. So your uncle, as you mentioned, Dr. Maupin, was one of those who was instrumental in helping us over that course of time to, to push some piecemeal attempts, right? So let me, let me just go back and, and ditto everything that Dr. Morris and Dr. Davis uh, stated in terms of how to tackle this in a pretty comprehensive manner. But going back, you know, 400 years, I think a lot of us know, you know, that Massachusetts was the first state that legalized slavery in this country. But we, we beyond the legalization of slavery, we've often not realized that right after that, there were a series of policies that were enacted, right, to, to prohibit Black and Indigenous uh, people from being able to raise their own food, from being able to learn how to read and write, especially English from learning, from being able to congregate with one another, to socialize with, with their communities, right? They had to get passes in order to do so, or lanterns if they were traveling at night into the predominant community. And, and you see a lot of these policies, right, that have been recycled from one generation to the next over time, from one century to the next. And while we have moved away from what we call in the law facially uh, discriminatory laws to, uh, to more facially neutral laws, they've still had a negative impact on the black community, right? And on, on and brown communities. So I, I, would, I would, you know, argue that in terms of the work that we're doing, we're trying to get to the drivers of these inequities over time. And I think that what we've been doing is, uh, is, is aligned with what Dr. Davis just talked about with, you know, you gotta start with the data. And one of the things that we realized as we entered this uh, COVID pandemic was that when you look back at uh, all of the pandemics that have struck the United States, it is the same group of people, right? The same ones who, that have been on the downside of advantage and opportunity throughout the life course that are the ones that are most negatively impacted by pandemics. Now, if, if that's the case, why has that been? And one of the reasons why is because we weren't able to get the data. And you had 
policymakers, public health professionals during this time from 1793 until today saying that, well, we don't know if it's negatively impacting, you know, the black community or brown communities more than the white community. Uh, what evidence do you have? Well, at Morehouse School of Medicine, we have been, you know, really moving forward on trying to collect that evidence because we know that that data is absolutely critical. If we have that data, we can show that there's a problem. And if there is a problem, it makes it easier for us to advocate for the resources then, right? Or at least use that lever to embarrass these folks, these opponents of health equity. So what we have been doing is to create this comprehensive health equity tracker. It's a data platform with our um, engineers and data scientists at Google and at the CDC Foundation and others to figure out how can we track the inequities relative to COVID. We know when you look at the literature, um, the peer-reviewed journal articles, um, the, the research, when you look at even the issue of vaccine that Dr. Morse brought up, right, which we know is a very contentious issue right now. Again, the same groups of folks were the ones who were experimented on during these vaccine trials but then yet they were the last ones to receive whatever final vaccine had been created. So we want to look at the inequities relative to vaccines, to testing. We were uh, some of the folks early on at Morehouse and Meharry Medical College, Charles Drew and Howard Medical School, a consortium of black medical schools that said, you know what, we see an issue right now with getting our folks uh, access to testing, right? And mobile testing in the sort. Why is that happening? And so we, we channeled our resources and through collective agreement, you know, created various coalitions and consortia. And we use that to say, we need the data. We've got a snapshot of the data today, but we need to drill down even further to get a comprehensive picture of what's happening, not only relative to uh, COVID, but in terms of these comorbidities that we talked about, right? That strike disproportionately, whether it's HIV AIDS, uh, lupus, sickle cell anemia, obesity, diabetes, lung disease, heart disease, you mentioned it. Uh, we need to be able to track those and then we want to also align those with the social determinants and the political determinants of health data, right? To understand which policies have been mitigating inequities uh, during this time and even prior to that, and then which ones have been exacerbating and why, so that we can, we can use that data to hold our folks accountable. So that's a snapshot of some of the work that we're doing at uh, Morehouse School of Medicine, which I think is pretty exciting. Well, well one thing you mentioned, uh, you mentioned sickle cell anemia, and whenever yes. I have a group of uh, uh, very erudite brain trust type folks on, on the line. I have to push this out here because it's something that is, it, it's a, of grave importance. Okay, so we have 100,000 people in America with sickle cell anemia with the disease. We have 4 million African Americans with sickle cell trait. Mm -hmm. Less than 2% of them know that they have sickle cell trait. 2%. And if you have sickle cell trait, that means that you could die just like any other sickle cell disease. You've had 15 young black men die on the football field in Division I football from sickle cell trait, okay? Now, mm -hmm. this one thing, sickle cell trait, you're tested for it at birth. Since the 70s, every person, black or white, is tested for sickle cell trait at birth, which means there's no reason why any person in America that is of childbearing age should not know their sickle cell status. But 92% of the babies that are born with sickle cell disease, the two parents have no idea that they had sickle cell trait. So we're going to have to do this collectively, folks, to make sure that you don't even have to go get a test. All you got to do is make a phone call, and then we can we can eradicate sickle cell from our country, right? That is got to throw it out there. But that's leading up to this question, and it's about the education, the education. Medical school right now, literally, in 1978, we had 2,800 black men in medical school. Now we have 600. Dr. Davis, why do you think that happens? Why do you, what do you think we can do about it? Well, it's the same, unfortunately, the same uh, systemic and structural racism uh, that we've been talking about that impacts us across various sectors. We have continued um, to look at the data. Uh, we've continued to say uh, this is not appropriate, but we have not made uh, the systemic changes that are necessary. This is a place where we can't continue to focus on the training of those going forward and entering medical school without addressing the people responsible for that training, right? I'm, I'm not often um, a person who says you need to throw the baby out with the bathwater, but we need to get rid of some of these people, right? If we know 
that what we have been producing is getting worse with respect to diversity within medical education. We need to change the decision makers. We need to change those who are leading these institutions because even faced with the data, they are not willing to make the necessary steps. So there has to be a way more vocal advocacy for us in the same way we see the Black Lives Matter advocating uh, for those law enforcement officers who we know are not doing what they're supposed to do. We have to do the same thing in medical schools. We have been talking about this since before I went to medical school uh, and I won't tell my age, but I've been out for a long time. <laughs> right. And we're still we're still seeing the same outcome. So we need to start there. And, and, and I mean that that, as you mentioned, back in the 1960s, the dean at your medical school, you know, was still writing about uh, the inferiority uh, of people of color. We still have people teaching our up and coming health professionals who have those beliefs. Right. We need to have them removed because it's not going to change as we come into um, medical education, as you guys know, extremely paternalistic, the power structure there for those entering medical students who may be very proactive, irrespective of what color uh, they are in their race, they don't have any power. They have no way of being able to change the system. It's going to take us outside of the system to do that. In addition to those of us who have the power to hire and fire for those who are coming into our healthcare systems need to hold our professionals accountable. If you are not providing culturally competent, compassionate care, if you have poor outcomes, we have plenty of data in our electronic health records. We got to look at it and care about the differences. If those providers have differences that are rooted in race-based decisions, get rid of them, get rid of them. We have been so committed to providers from a policy and political standpoint. I don't know about in other states, but in Louisiana, a doctor damn near has to walk up to somebody and shoot them yeah. before they lose their license. We do everything to try to recidivate this person, right? Um, no matter what they're doing, if they're providing bad care, then we need to just get rid of them. We need to start holding ourselves accountable for this and stop accepting less because that's what we've been doing. I agree, sister. Amen. Let me, let me, let me, let me switch gears here a little quick because we don't have that much time left. Um, we know that a vaccine is on the way. If, it's, if, if there's a vaccine out before November 3rd, don't take it. Don't take it. Now, if there's a vaccine out after November 4th, then we can talk about that, okay? Um, I, I, how many, are any of you doing clinical trials? Uh, and, and we want to talk about that because vaccines and clinical trials, that's on the ground, that's time that it is what it is. I'm doing two clinical trials right now for vaccines two on monoclonal antibodies. And one of the vac one of the monoclonal antibodies we've shown, and I get more black patients in clinical trials than anybody else in the country, one of those have shown has shown that you have a 74% decrease in hospitalization if you take this monoclonal antibody and all my patients were black. So I feel like we were guinea pigs. We know that this medicine works for us. Okay. That's a very important thing. Historical distrust. Can each of you give me just a little blurb since we're running out of time? What are you doing as far as educating the community on when this vaccine comes? Should they take it? Should they take the flu vaccine or not? Should they take monoclonal antibody? Should they be in clinical trials? Just I'll go to you, Dr. Morse. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm so glad you brought it up. And I, I want to actually start by saying that research uh, has shown, uh, believe it or not, that if we were to eliminate the racial wealth gap, that COVID-19 transmission would decrease by between 30 and 68%. And so that's pretty much as good as a vaccine, right? Um, and so I think that more research of that ilk needs to be done uh, it's not to say the vaccine's not important. That's not what I'm trying to say. But I am trying to say there is so much more than the vaccine as well. 
and eliminating the racial wealth gap would be a great place to start in terms of protecting communities against COVID. Um, but for the vaccine specifically, what we're looking at, at least in the global campaign against racism, is actually the global vaccine nationalism that's happening and the fact that the most wealthy countries have actually already bought up way more than their fair share of the vaccine, which leaves us in a situation where, you know, the global south, uh, many of the countries that are in the campaign against racism are already at a systematic disadvantage. And that's not even getting to Black America. That's just talking about on a global scale what's happening to Black people globally. And so I, I do think having that global analysis is important. I do think it's important to recognize, you know, that, that organizations like Oxfam are doing analyses showing the fact that if we continue down this path of, of the countries in the global north, taking the majority of the vaccine, we're gonna have far more global losses to COVID that are preventable than taking another strategy that included more global coordination. But when it comes to the vaccine, I think it's really important that we also recognize that there are endless barriers to access, right? Um, whether it's you know how you actually get to uh, a clinic, how you actually uh, access either in a, a language other than English, um, you know, a, a can you communicate uh, through sign language, et cetera. There are many other ways that there are barriers. And I think that we have not seen um, a clear answer from local government and federal government, frankly, about how some of those barriers are going to be overcome. So I think that that's tremendously important. I also think that we have a lot more data before we can make any clear uh, advice, give any clear advice to communities about what to do around this vaccine. But one of my biggest concerns is the global distribution inequities that are going to impact the African diaspora in ways that I'm very nervous about. Yeah. And, and if, yeah, if, if I could, if I could add to that too. So, you know, at Morehouse School of Medicine, to answer your question, we are, you know, deeply alarmed by the dearth of African Americans who have been enrolled in the vaccine trials. And I do agree with you that if something comes out November 3rd, you shouldn't be taking that. Um, one of the issues that we've had is that um, when you look at a lot of these uh, trials, these uh, uh, vaccine trials, they, they waited to the last minute to bring in black physicians and scientists. And they want you to push to enroll more African-Americans in these uh, vaccine trials. So, you know, that's always a, a stunt, I think, that is pulled in many cases throughout our history where they bring them on at the last minute. And then a lot of African-Americans, if you look, look at Tuskegee, many African-American physicians and, and, and uh, scientists were used, right? Unbeknownst to them by uh, governmental interests. So I think that is something we're very wary about. But recently we received a $40 million grant from the US Department of Health and Human Services. And we decided we wanted to create a national COVID resiliency network. And in this network, the idea is we were troubled uh, by the lack of testing. So we want to make sure folks are getting access to testing. We want to create a green book of sorts, right? Just like in the civil rights movement, a green book of providers, of clinicians, uh, of places that you can go that, that take an equity lens, that we know value these communities and have a track record in doing so. So as, as part of that effort, we will be using this uh, grant money to help link people to those primary care services, behavioral health services, social services, and the like to ensure that they're getting what they need when they need it um, in the amount that they need to to reach their optimal level of health. And, and, and from the vaccine perspective, since I know that's where you were going specifically, what we also are doing is uh, we will be a, a vaccine trial site. Uh, we're working to get that up and running. Uh, we will then, uh, you know, recruit and we will have our, our physicians and our scientists there from the very beginning to monitor and to be able to vet this stuff and working in concert with the National Medical Association that is also convening to vet and, 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 and uh, analyze and understand, uh, you know, which vaccines actually would help the community versus which ones have been, you know, slap shot, essentially. So those are some of the things we're doing. We welcome, you know, any individuals, anybody who's interested in getting involved in that work with us. Absolutely. Um, yeah, I'd love to hear more about it. I know um, we're running out of um, time, but uh, we too uh, are very weary uh, of uh, the um, warp speed uh, of some of the, the vaccine trials, but have um, committed, uh, as we always have, to being a trusted voice for our community. We're very protective of our community and they value uh, our stance. And it is extremely important 
uh, for uh, our community members uh, to be able to engage in vaccine trials uh, when uh, we know that a vaccine is safe um, for them to do it. So we have partnered to be a site uh, for a, a phase three clinical trial. Um, but uh, to Dr. Dawes's point, Dr. Morse, um, it's important for our providers to understand um, directly um, what has occurred uh, to get the trial to this phase, to look at the safety and efficacy data themselves, make their own determinations before we can actually advocate for it. Because again, we are very protective of our community. We know the importance uh, of them receiving the vaccine, but we want to make sure that if we would not be willing to get it ourselves, uh, that we are not advocating for anything uh, for our community. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, I think at this time we are at the point and I'm going to say my last sentiment and turn it back over to Mitch. And Mitch and mine is going to be a quote because the most beautiful people we know, like all the beautiful people here, have known defeat. They've known suffering, they've known struggle, and they have found a way out of their depths. They have an understanding of life that fills them with compassion, and beautiful people don't just happen. They're created through hardship after hardship. Thank everyone here, and I, I appreciate you. Whatever I can do to help you, I will do. And Mitch, I'll turn it back over to you, sir. To which I say amen. Corey, Dr. Abra, thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Davis, thank you. Dr. Morse, uh, Councilor Daniel, thank you for a great conversation. Uh, you, you left us with so much to think about uh, in so many different ways. Uh, I think that Daniel originally said in the beginning, political determinants of health created, perpetuated, and exacerbated the social determinants of health. And everything fits really into that box. You guys are American treasures. We are so happy and thankful to have you. I appreciate your insights and your knowledge. And we look forward to having everybody, everybody join us next Thursday for our conversation on economic equity. See you all then, and thank you all so very much for joining us today. Thank you.